Hello, David Zritsky for the Bond Experience. Welcome back. Today, you can clearly see that my guest here is poised, ready, talons are out because we are back to debating. They're scary. You can't <laughs> see them as close as I am. But we're here to debate a movie that I, I thought was not debatable. And yet, my guest has proven me wrong. Calvin Dyson, welcome to discuss From Russia With Love. Hi, David. Thank you very much for having me on. This is like, this is definitely my biggest Bond sin. Like, I'm happy that you acknowledge that up front. Like, this is like the Bond fan equivalent of like farting in church or like spilling a drink on a bride at a wedding. Like, it, you know, to, to say that this film is kind of meh and not have it in your top 10 is a very unpopular opinion. So I'm, I'm, I'm well expecting most of the comments on this video are going to be agreeing with you on this. Yeah, I don't I don't think we're even looking for a winner loser here. I think it's more of, you know, I'm a gas and I just want to hear more about the damage that's done to you clearly as a child <laughs> to create this this hate. And I don't think it's hate, right? You don't hate the film. No, 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 definitely not. It's it's like we talk about this even in the ones that we don't like as much as some of the others I, I don't think any Bond film is unwatchable. Like, and I still, like, I watched this film just this morning in preparation for this wow. thing. And, and I certainly enjoyed a lot of it, but it, it when it com kind of comes down to like doing a ranking and you're like, which one would you rather watch? Would you rather watch, you know, dare I say the man with the golden gun or from Rush With Love? I'm like, I'm with the golden gun actually, I think. And it's only when you do it like that, I'm like, oh wow, it's kind of low down. Yeah, and uh, and people do say like, how can you not love it? And I ask that to myself. Like, I can't believe that I don't love it. I really want to love this film every time I come to it. But um, well, I guess we'll get into details as we go through. We we have just a, a few subjects to talk about. Excellent, as as usual. <laughs> we and by the way, for those of you watching, Calvin and I are just getting better and better at prepping this stuff. We just come up with some really crazy topics. So <laughs> I'm going to start off differently. Usually I start out asking you, you know, give me an overview of how you feel about this film. And I'm, I'm actually going to start because as I rewatch this and I kept banging my head into my hand, like, how can he not? Um, <laughs> there's a couple of words that come to mind when I think of From Russia With Love. And even in this, I don't know how many viewings I've had. Um, it is not, and I started to see Kind of Calvin's eyes. It is not a happy-go-lucky, fantastical, magical romp, which you tend to gravitate to. To me, it is filled with intrigue, that good spy intrigue. It has a certain class to it. I mean, it really, the way it's filmed, everything. But this is a story about danger. Mm -hmm. This is Bond's story. There's a certain seriousness to it. And, you know, it also has this I'll call it a title of being this cinematic treasure. I mean, when you think about Hitchcock films, for example, North by Northwest, it's a cinematic treasure. From Russia with Love, even if you put outside of the Bond connection, it's a cinematic treasure. And that's why I'm going into this, kind of scratching my head, like, where are we gonna go with this for an hour? But <laughs> I'm dying to hear your overview, you know, what's, what's your, uh, what's your thinking on this? Touching on Hitchcock there, you may well have touched upon one of the reasons why I struggle to connect with this because I am such, like Alfred Hitchcock is my favorite movie director. Like I absolutely adore the vast majority of his filmography. North by Northwest is, is the perfect comparison to mm -hmm. From Russia With Love. Um, there's even scenes in From Russia With Love that try to sort of do a similar thing, try to yes. ape that. And I think maybe an I, I think it does come down to Terence Young as a director, and I know that we've talked about him on the, the Thunderball uh, debate that we did, um, because he did another film, I think it was after Thunderball, called Wait Until Dark, which is a thriller starring Audrey Hepburn, and it's quite a small thing, it's mainly set in one apartment, and she's a blind lady, and there are these thugs that come in, and, and it, anyway, there's a bit of intrigue and, and all that kind of stuff, but I have a similar feeling watching that that I did with this, where I'm like, oh, it's so... If Hitchcock did this, I think it would just like tip it over the edge into something that I would really enjoy. But as I'm watching it, I'm like, Hitchcock could have done that better. Hitchcock probably would have made something more of this. And I had that same, I've had that same feeling with most Terence Young films that I've seen. I think he does have a lot of strengths, but there is just something about, I think the film has a great momentum for like the first half hour. And then we get to the gypsy camp and then it kind of starts to trail off a bit for me. Um, and I think I, and as, as you said, like I certainly gravitate more towards 
The Spy Who Loved Me, uh, Goldfinger, You Only Live Twice, Moonraker, those kind of big yeah. bombastic uh, fun romps. And this isn't that, this is something very, very different. So, uh, and I think probably it took until Casino Royale before we got something. I think there's even more humor in the likes of Majesty's Secret Service and for, you know, for your eyes only. There's still some humor, there's still some larger than life elements, but I really think it took From Rush With Love until Casino Royale before we got something like that again. Well, let's 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 connect on a couple themes because we're gonna we're gonna jump around a little bit. Um, so I want to talk about Doctor No to From Russia with Love because I think when I talk to people about Doctor No, I love Doctor No for it's historic and it was the first. You know, everybody's first is very special. Everybody's first love. Everybody's <laughs> first bond. But it is the first, so you have to give it some you know deference. But he was very serious in Dr. No. I mean, there was, I mean, zero, like flatline humor. Mm. I almost feel like from Russia with Love brought us a more comfortable Connery, a more comfortable Bond. And he definitely has more acting inflections. You know, he can get very mad. He can get very happy. He can get very nervous. He can get very angry. I mean, he's just, he, he goes through all these things. So I do think a big part of that is Terrence Young, who, mm you know, fault him however you want, he does know how to direct Connery. And I think that Connery became more comfortable in this. I think the script allowed Bond to move away from the book Bond, who was very serious and kind of, you know, lacking in confidence. And this was the first Bond I saw from Russia with Love that said, here's the confident Bond that swaggers, that loves women, you know, that, that can charm people, that can charm enemies. Um, I will say this, I give you fully the Hitchcock thing and I'll tell you why it really <laughs> resonated for me. I always do research on my, on my brother in arms, Calvin, and I watched <laughs> your first few ages ago. Oh God, that's good. Reviews of From Russia With Love. I love going back and watching those. Again, you're so different now. You <laughs> matured wonderfully, um, but they're fun. And, and one of the things you called out was Hitchcock. Now I have recently been watching the Hitchcock films in mm. lockdown. In fact, I just, I saw North by Northwest a month ago. I saw To Catch a Thief just a oh, week amazing. ago. Oh my God. I mean, just amazing. The style, everything. And, you yeah. know, you and I could talk an hour about Hitchcock, but I definitely saw it. You know, the train scene, um, the suspense in when he's talking to Grant, uh, mm. harkened back to even Psycho with the shower scene. Mm. Uh, the helicopter, North by Northwest helicopter, helicopter, airplane, explosion, chasing. I mean, <laughs> I, I could definitely see the drop. And the biggest one, the biggest Hitchcockian thing, which was the lector. It's mm. a MacGuffin. I mean, yeah. he is really going after that MacGuffin. And, and for those that don't know what a MacGuffin is, it's a Hitchcockian term. It's very interesting, but it basically is an object that the hero is searching for. But in the end, it's not the MacGuffin that's important. It's the search within the hero. And it's the redemption. And that was Hitchcock's theme through most of his movies. So you definitely saw it in here. But I'm actually on the side that I think it enhanced. Mm. I mean, imagine if you're going to borrow from any director, borrow from Hitchcock. Oh, no, totally. And and they were sort of, I think they were considering Hitchcock or trying to get him on as a director on like Dr. No in like the very early days when they were looking around for, for someone. Um, but this is very much like Bond films throughout time have been influenced by different things happening in cinema. And this very much feels like the Hitchcock Bond film. And, and I do love, I'm guessing we'll get into scenes in more detail, but the train sequence in particular is something that I really enjoy um, yeah. and we'll probably talk more about it then. I agree with you just on your Terence Young comments about Connery as well. I, I very much agree with that. And I think that Terence Young's real strength comes in casting and characters. Like I think he mm. really helps actors build their characters like so well and they feel they feel like real people but also there's an element of fantasy to them and I think he can cast just the right faces in each role like um Pedro Almendares is Karen Bay is someone we're going to talk about I think everyone loves that guy and it's just that perfect like and because I was watching some of the behind the scenes stuff and listening to interviews and the like. I know that on this film in particular, Terence Young was very much involved in the casting and it was all very much kind of people he knew. And, um, you know, I think Pedro Almendares was suggested by John Huston, who was like a director, a, a friend of uh, Terence Young's, which is uh, which is interesting. But, uh, but certainly on the Bond front, I think 
Connery's kind of flawless in this. He's like so perfect in this film. Yeah, and and you know what? Let's, let's stay on on Bond for a second and Connery because again, mm. I love to see his evolution. And I know you know you and I have talked about uh, you know Thunderball and things like that. But I really do think up until you only live twice, Connery was this I I constant involve involving of of a mm. character and his comfort. It's almost like. Um, you know, people say this about Robert Downey Jr. and Iron Man. You know, he started out pretty comfortable. Then he, then by the third movie, he was just like swarmy and all over this place and funny. And I feel uh -huh. that in From Russia With Love. And again, I'm going to go back to this. You and I have talked about this. I like Bond movies that they put Bond, Bond at the center. And he's mm. everywhere. I mean, he's even... There's even a fake Bond in the very beginning. Like even the beginning has, has an image and an aspect to Bond. So it sounds like you enjoyed Bond in this Bond movie. Oh, very much so, yeah. And I, I mean, it, it is like, I think you, you said this earlier on, it is his movie. Like, it's he's not overshadowed by any villains. He's not overshadowed by the Bond girl or, you know, I would I would say that him and Robert Shaw as Red Grant are pretty toe-to-toe. -to -toe, and, and that's really another example of brilliant casting. Um, but yeah, no, and, and it takes a while for us to get to him as well. He doesn't turn up until about 20 minutes into the film, like Bond proper. We have the pre-title sequence with Sean Connery, but as a different character. And that's quite brave that they would take their time so long to actually get to him, which uh, similar to in the book, I, I guess, um, you know, you had your From Russia With Love book club uh, not that long ago. And uh, about a third of that is just introducing Red Grant. Uh, well, and that's the thing too. And I, I've, I've got so many positive pins I'm going to be putting in your in your voodoo doll of you but um this is that's another one is that this follows the book so closely down to mm. even some of the lines um and in the book to your point a huge portion of the book happens and you get so much wonderful background even before Bond is introduced so you really feel like you know the nemesis here you know you know the plot you know what he's got to go after and I'll call it the gravitas, the seriousness, which I love in this film, of what Bond needs to do is mm. so important. And the first time you see Bond, you know, he's macking out in like one of those bunting boats and things like that, whatever that is. And you see the beeper, but he's frivolous. You know, he's he's having a, a lie down, you know, laying pipe with, you know, some woman. But then suddenly he gets thrust into this adventure that is is deadly serious. Mm. Um, and, the, and the odds are great. And I love that aspect with Bond. All right, so story-wise, because I'm starting to talk about the story, what did you think of the overall story? Uh, well, I, I think to touch on what you just said about it being so close to the book, I think that from a story perspective, that can be quite detrimental sometimes. And I think this is an example of that where I feel like it, it, like I say, I feel like the first half hour is really good. We see the villains setting up all of their evil scheme. We know what they're going to do. And it's, you know, we, we're going to see it play out, which is really exciting. I like that when Bond gets the sort of call to action, it, it, it's kind of based in character as well, because he's not just being told you need to go on this mission. He sees the photo of Tatiana and he's like, ah, oh, okay, yep, I, I, I will go on this mission after all. Like if he, you know, if she hadn't been so beautiful and so appealing to him, maybe he'd have just said no. And I like that his character is coming into the deciding factor of whether or not to go on the mission and kind of what attitude he's going in with. That's That's really fun. From about the gypsy camp sequence onwards, I feel like there are so many tangents and so many different characters in there that you could just amalgamate some characters and maybe that would make things a bit easier to understand. I, I don't really know. There are so many twists and turns that I feel like it could almost have done with some streamline, streamlining, streamlining. And th th there are bits like in the gypsy camp sequence, for instance, we get the... Um, the belly dancer, which mm. is all really good. And I quite like that as an example of Bond experiencing some local flavor, if you will. I know that that sequence is filmed in Pinewood Studios, but nonetheless, it's still him experiencing a bit of a different culture. And I think Connery is great in that as well. When the belly dancer is like draping herself on him and you see his eyes are just so, oh, he's fantastic there. But then after that, we have this sequence of these two gypsy ladies who are fighting over a bloke and we're going to watch them fight for a few minutes. And I'm like, what does this have to do with anything? Like I was fine with that 
one bit of kind of local sort of uh, character and then it kind of, and, and that's, I feel like it just goes on a few too many tangents and then all of a sudden we're with Karim trying to kill this guy who we didn't really know a couple of scenes ago, but now this is apparently really important. And I feel like until we get onto the train, I feel like it kind of meanders a bit in that middle bit. It's, it's, it's all fair points. I think that um, I see it in a very different way. And again, it's the filter we put this all through. So for example, I, I take the gypsy camp as a little bit of lightness for the film itself, because again, this was the starting of the formula where they wanted to show women and mm -hmm. women fighting each other. You know, some, some people, I, I can't believe this. They're into that. They think that's titillating. <laughs> um, a perfect example is Red Grant. Um, you know, getting his massage. Mm -hmm. Now, unfortunately, the last few massages I've had, a woman has never stripped down for me. I am going to be asking for my <laughs> money back. Outrageous. But I mean, even that is very titillating. Like, was she going to get oil all over herself? But if you read the book, she does that kind of same thing. So I think they were keeping very tight to Fleming's vision. Mm. And that's the biggest thing is like, all of these things is about, to me, what I call dimensionality. So having the gypsy camp and having him say that gypsy guy and Kieran Bay now trusts him and says, you know, you're, you and I are together is formulating this team because they just met each other, but now they've been in a fight. And mm -hmm. when you fight in the trenches, you, you build this, excuse the pun, bond and connection. So I took it as almost like they're adding so many layers from familiarity to really knowing a person. And then, mm -hmm. you know, you're seeing the bad guy team and kind of them getting to know each other as well. So you're building this up over, over time. And by the way, the mission thing was one of my favorite things, like Bond getting a folder and a mission. And then, you know, I always have props. I you love know, this. The whole thing of like, you know, seeing, you oh, know, the nice. Red Grant thing. And uh, uh, of course, you know, the picture. And, oh, that's amazing. This is before that uh, he actually wrote on it from Russia with love, you know, the kind of the background scenes of who she is. I love those aspects because I miss so much Bond, even today with Daniel Craig's just sitting in M's office mm. and I'm going, right, going to send you out on something. I mean, we're not going to get that in no time to die either. So it's like, mm. I'm craving for it. I got to go back to the 1960s for it, I guess. All the MI6 stuff in this one's really great. Like when he comes in and he tosses the hat and then says, for my next miracle, I shall. And then he's like embarrassed himself in front of them. That is really lovely. Like they do feel like, and obviously Desmond Llewellyn's in it for the first time, which is really cool. And the attache case gadget's really nice. I, I do love all that. To your point about um, the scenes, and I, and I think that's what you're saying is very true as well. I think those scenes are there to kind of show more of a, you know, more from a character perspective, really, then they're not necessarily moving the plot forward as such, but they are sort of uh, making friendships and that kind of stuff. I was thinking that about the the scenes at the end, like with the, the, the helicopter thing and then the boat chase, because I'm like, I guess that that's there so that Tanya and Bond can bond, for lack of a better word, um, over those two uh, adventures, because really you could just end the film when they get off the train with the lector and say yep they got in the car and they went to venice and, and that was kind of it and instead we have these two sort of protracted action sequences um I, I, how do you feel about those scenes in particular so do you it's a good point i i actually put in my notes here um this has as many endings as lord of the rings and it is <laughs> and and maybe maybe i will give you weekly um mm -hmm that it has too many endings. I felt that too. It's like, mm -hmm. you know, the, first of all, the train scene, no matter how anybody feels about the movie, it's, it's one of these things where the train scene just stands out. Mm -hmm. as maybe even one of the best action scenes and um, dialogue and things like that. But then you have these kind of strange scenes that do feel a little forced. Now the helicopter is one where I'm like, okay, well, they're meeting up and, and that kind of fits. But then you have the boat scene. Mm. And then the boat scene, it's like, oh my gosh, like they're just having like another big action scene. It does tend to go on a little bit. Um, and then that's not the end. <laughs> like they don't go, Woof. <laughs> then they're in Venice and yeah. they're on another boat in the water. <laughs> and, you know, with the film like this, and I'm like, Calvin's right. This has a lot of <laughs> endings to it. But, you know, I'm almost wondering 
and, and it, I didn't fault Lord of the Rings for it. And I kind of mm. never faulted this for it either. It does seem like it ha might have one extra one tacked on. I'll give you that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I, I think for, for me, it's the boat sequence, probably. Like at that point, I'm kind of like, huh, this is, and I don't know if they just needed to get so many explosions into the film and they needed a more explosive finale because the the true finale comes in a hotel room and it's bond fighting as sort of an older lady and that, you know it's not oh, as that ending too yeah <laughs> i almost forgot that ending my gosh and it's like well in doctor no we had this big explosion so maybe we yeah. need some of that um here as well and i think it's it's interesting to talk about how troubled the production was of this one in particular like again like going through some of the behind the scenes stuff they were rewriting the script on the set even when they thought they'd finished filming they needed to go back and refilm stuff because they needed to tweak dialogue because it didn't make so much sense peter hunt was changing things around in the editing room um there was issues obviously with pedro armandaras because he was very ill so they had yeah, to change dying. the schedule yeah exactly so they had to sort of change the schedule because he was really determined that he wanted to finish the film um, and, and factoring all that into account, it's quite amazing, really, that they managed to come out with what they did. Um, uh, I mean, honestly, kind of a, a masterpiece to me. And, and mm. you know, let's, let's take some of the individual parts, because I think mm. underneath the crust here, there might be more buttery, delicious filling mm. than, than you've let on, even for you. So let, let's talk about our boy, Red Grant, um, uh -huh. Robert Shaw, who was absolutely fantastic um, to me. Um, I thought he was a great character. I thought he represented, again, kind of the book come to life and actually better. I mm. think that he added, especially during the train scene, so much personality. Um, clearly, you know, am I or sorry, the uh, the bad guy, Smirsher, um, having acting skills and things like that, because he did a great job. But what did you think about the character? What did you think about his portrayal? Well, I, I, yeah, this is definitely point to David. Uh, I, I love it. Finally. <laughs> he's terrific. And it's, I mean, he's a fantastic actor anyway in everything. It's like Robert Shaw's never going to give a bad performance. But how much of a character and personality he has to say, he doesn't actually have that many lines of dialogue in the film. And it's not until about like, what, an hour and 15 minutes in, something like that, until he finally does have an opportunity to speak. And even then he's kind of affecting this. He's you know, pretending to be Nash, he's pretending to be this other agent. So he's putting on a bit of a plummy voice and all that kind of stuff. And the little business when he gives Bond the business card. I love that Connery's reaction. That's such a nice little funny bit. But it's like, it, I mean, the, the series tries to do this kind of dark side of Bond thing every once in a while. It is a type of a, a Bond villain that we get every once in a while. I think they do with Sanchez, with um, Alec Trevelyan. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like, oh, this guy could have been Bond had his life gone a different way kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And that has never been better than here. It's like they both feel like so toe to toe and that fight sequence on the train is the best hand to hand fight sequence in all of Bond probably. It's phenomenal. Um, the dialogue's really good. Uh, I, I can't fault him at all. And of course he makes the crucial error of uh, ordering white, uh, red wine with his fish, which is a super memorable moment. <laughs> which as somebody who's not English, I'll, I've asked so many people, is that really like, I mean, will you like punch somebody out if that's the case and suspect them? <laughs> and by the way, I put in my notes, one thing that I noticed in this movie this time, and again, I'll, I'll give deference to the director, but I think it's the actors who really brought it, were these little tiny subtle, facial movements, these little nods, these little winks, these little like purses of the lips. And, and Robert Shaw did such a great job. There's one point when he he takes out his his watch and he he slowly just starts to, you know, take out his thing. <laughs> and But he does it so slowly and he's looking at the wire almost like regarding it. And yeah. I loved when he did that because I don't know if somebody told him to do that, but it's this spy craft. It's really appreciating the fact that you are an assassin. You know, and where the older Bonds, they're more of a spy, you know, he's more of a spy than an assassin. I think the foil of this like very scary individual was so profound. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree. 
And I think it was probably really helpful for the actor that Fleming went so far into the character's backstory in the book. Like, you know, you can read that first third and it tells you everything you need to know about Red Grant from when he was a boy pretty much and, until his recruitment and all that kind of stuff. A part of me would kind of love to have seen that in the film. I know it would have been impossible. We wouldn't have wanted really this whole sort of like tangent about Grant's uh, childhood and whatnot. And I think the film does a really good job at just very quickly establishing him. And when Rosa Klebb puts on the knuckle dusters and like punches him in the stomach, it's so perfect. He just has a slight twinge on his face of like, oh, and then, but then that's it. It's so well done. Um, yeah, I would have loved a bit more of that backstory, but yeah, yeah no, he's he's terrific, brilliant villain. When this starts, you have, you have a gun barrel. And yes. of course we know it's not Sean Connery, but it's still a gun barrel, which is exciting. But um, you know, the music starts and mm. we've got to talk about, you know, the theme, the title mm. and the music. What, uh, what do you feel about those? The, uh, from Rush With Love, the opening instrumental and all that, I love it. Uh, yeah, no, it's, it's one of my favorite songs actually. Uh, and I think it's one of my favorite Barry soundtracks. It's, I've got the vinyl, so I listen to it quite regularly. Uh, I, I, yeah, it's, it's brilliant. And, particularly coming off of Dr. No as well, where I think the soundtrack left a lot to be desired. And I know there were a lot of behind the scenes issues regarding um, what eventually ended up on screen in that one, but it didn't have that quintessential Bond sound like from Russia With Love does. And in that way, it was a trailblazer from that respect. How do you feel about it? I I love the music. Mm. I, I loved the soundtrack um, so much, in fact, that it's one of these that I regularly play, like if I'm in yeah. the car or something like that, or just relaxing. I will say, I will say that I do feel like they overused the Bond theme. Oh, yes. So, <laughs> and and I did notice it, especially this time around where even the most subtle things, you're playing the Bond theme. So what happens as you know, is it becomes neutral. It's not special anymore, mm -hmm. as opposed to, you know, David Arnold, who would use the Bond theme during like really, you know, big, important times and areas. But uh, yeah, what did you think about the Bond theme being used so much? Uh, I mean, I love it as a theme. I, it's always a pleasure to hear it, but it is used in, I don't know if it was just, they didn't have time to write a new piece of music or something, so just slap it on there. But when it's sort of like punctuating moments, like when he gives the tip to the guy in the uh, in the hotel, and it's like the you know the guy just like takes the tip, and you get the ba da ba da ba da, and it's like, what is, is this a big moment? Uh, it, it's quite strange it's when a it's a big used. tip. You see how the guy's face is like, boy, thank you. <laughs> And in that way, it is, yeah, I, I don't know if they did just run out of time or, or what it was, but because uh, they're clearly using the same recording that they had in Dr. No as well. So it's mm -hmm. not like it's uh, newly done or anything. Um, but but yeah, aside, that aside, I think the rest of the score is is quite lovely, even in some of the softer moments like Bond and um, Tatiana when they're in bed first meeting and that beautifully slow rendition of the title theme is one of my favorite Bond tracks. I think it's absolutely yeah. lovely. That's great to hear. You love the music. You oh, love, yeah. love, love the music. Yeah. Were you so expecting like me a... not to love it? Well, I just, I guess I'm collecting points <laughs> um, and, and I'm counting like 43 to one. Yeah. But that's okay. <laughs> this is all about self-discovery. Um, speaking of self-discovery, you discovered a, a Q moment, I think, that you mentioned you really like. I mean, this, the, the attache case. Classic. Oh, yeah. Oh, it, it's such a great little gadget. Um, it's it's not like a proper Q scene, like what we will get later on. They're still clearly developing that character. And Desmond Llewellyn is just here to sort of say, this is your thing. This is what it does. Go off and do it. There's no character there as such. Um, I'm always so distracted in this film by Desmond Llewellyn's hands. Like, I know it's not fair to just like focus They're in like on- They're like bananas. Such... They're huge. They really are. And like, yeah. you can see like where he smokes because he has like these tobacco stains like in between two of his fingers. And then one of his nails is kind of looks like he got caught in a car door or something. Yeah. I'm like, huh, that's really interesting. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, I, 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 the one thing that, you know, as I, as I went through this and I really was thinking, you know, try to, trying to think in your brain yeah. You know, put myself in your shoes. And it was a very disturbing moment. But one of the things that I found is little scenes that I thought, what could make this better? And I mm -hmm. do think that the Q scene with Desmond Llewellyn, having a little bit of interaction with him might have been interesting, but really mm -hmm. it was just laying out one of the coolest gadgets 
yeah. in all of Bond history, you know, with all the different things, even down to, I thought was interesting was the, uh, the gold sovereigns, which this is an actual gold sovereign. No way. It is. Oh, wow. You know, little protective thing, but he had the gold sovereigns. And I thought how genius is they had a gadget that had all these things, but it also had gold sovereigns. So if you're stuck in the middle of some country somewhere, you could bribe yourself out of it, which was just, Again, it's the serious thinkingness of this film. Mm, yeah, no, totally. It's it, it is one of the more kind of. I mean, I, I'd love a la I'd love a laser watch more than anything else in the world. I don't know if in my day to day I would find as much use for it as uh, well. Well, would I find much use for a sniper's rifle in my uh, day to day use? Probably not. <laughs> but, uh, I could see you carrying like an attaché case, like a nice Swain and Adney attaché case. Oh no, I I think they're very nice. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Let's get on that. If I had papers to carry that were of any value. <laughs> exactly. Totally exactly. <laughs> um, oh, I'm sorry, Calvin. One second. I just noticed I'm um, required at once. Um, no. Oh, that's all so right, cool. My apologies. This is embarrassing. <laughs> I, I'm going to just ignore this, but uh, all right. So we've got to talk about. You need to finish up that chess match that you're playing while you're doing I, this. And then just ignore everybody as you leave. He's so rude, that Kronstein, isn't like, he? I, yeah. <laughs> but let's talk about him because I do like him as this like weasley, mm. slimy, but, you know, obviously very strategic mm. character. Um, some people ding him because they feel it was it was a throwaway role. Like, you know, you put him in there and it's like you didn't give him much to do. Um, I like the creepiness of it, but I don't know mm. if he, if he plays a significant role. Do you feel the same way? Oh, completely, yeah. And uh, in the book, he has a really cool part because they very much make a big deal out of this is Kronstein and his brain is, you know, more criminal and dastardly than anyone else on the planet and all that kind of stuff. And he's very much the architect of Spectre's scheme, which is really cool. And I think in the book that works. And this is another instance where I, you know, I, I know that there are some fans who think that, the closer you are to adapting Fleming as faithfully as possible, that is going to make for a stronger film. I'm not necessarily, I think there are many instances of iconography in film that, mm. you know, uh, Dorothy's ruby slippers, for instance, aren't in the original books. And that was a pure invention for the screen. And I think uh, we see that with Bond as well. There's no massive volcano there, but that's such a, an iconic thing now because of, yeah. because of the film. And I think Kronstein is one of those elements where you could just cut him out. I think his, the scenes, like the actor does a great job and the scenes that he's in, particularly the chess scene, I think is really nice and suspenseful. I really like that scene. But I mean, could it not have been Kleb who came up with the plan or Blofeld or, you know, why do we need to bring in this other guy to yeah, and I say th these I think, lines? I, I think you have a, a strong point, which is why I brought it up. I think the reason I do think it works, however, is you're showing an organization with multiple layers. This is very serious. It's not the, the top guy, you know, calling people in, you know, he's got his little desk thing and he calls, you know, Cleb in, then he calls all these guys and he calls, you know, Stamper. It's like, um, no, it's, it's an, I'm sorry. This is just terrible excuses to. I, I'm expecting like three different people now to walk into your room. Like you. By the way, them. yeah, I, you know, I haven't hit this fourth one. I wonder what this fourth one does. <laughs> oh dear, that's. A whole uh, building just came down. That's New no, York but, gone. <laughs> but it's so many different layers, which is why I like this. And I love that mm. um, there is someone that is there to do strategy. There is someone there to do coercion. Mm. There is someone there that executes the plan, which is kind of the Kleb role. Mm. Mm. Um, so I like that multiple layers. And I love that they had to have a sacrificial lamb. And it wasn't a woman this mm. time, shockingly. It was a guy who gets kicked with the poison um, shoe, mm. which also again sets this up. So I think if you removed him out of the film, you would you would lose that feeling, that multi-dimensional layer, and also some of the foreshadowing for later. Mm. No, that's true. I, I think a big part of my disappointment with him comes down to the fact that we never have a scene with him and Bond. And he's such like a significant element of, like he came up with the plan. It's all kind of like his but thing. But he's not a field guy. And, well, yeah, yeah, Sometimes exactly. You know, not not everybody's made for the field. No, whatever that yeah. quote is from Scott. <laughs> no, that's true. But I still kind of want, like, you know, even Stromberg wasn't made for you know the field as such. Like mm. he very much stays in his base, and it's it feels weird. Like I'm not even sure if Bond is even aware that 
that character even exists. Like, it, he never comes up in sort of like a conversation or anything, whereas obviously, mm. and he doesn't with Blofeld, but Blofeld lives to go on to the next few films and you know yeah. that that's building up for something, whereas Cronston, you know, begins and ends in From Russia With Love and that's it. Uh, Calvin, I, I need to soften your heart. So I'm gonna, <laughs> we're gonna move to Rosa Klebb. Oh, what do you think about Rosa Klebb? I love her. Ah, uh, isn't she brilliant? Thank you. <laughs> if you if you said anything, I'd have to like disconnect this. Uh, and again, just uh, Terence Young's just eye for casting, and I haven't I haven't actually seen Lotte Lenya in any of the productions. From what I understand, she was actually a, a, a dancer. Yeah, she's like a very pretty, attractive, pretty. very beautiful lady. And in 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 the um the Criterion audio commentary, Terence Young does point out that she was, in his words, screwing everybody. And I'm like, oh wow, that's some information that I did not expect to find out, but uh, apparently so. So wow. she's obviously this quite freewheeling uh, character and in, in real life and to kind of be the antithesis of that and be really serious and really cold and really threatening like to say that she's a relatively small middle-aged woman like i she has so much threat to her like especially in that scene where she's recruiting tanya she's just like oh so scary um you're a fan i guess i'm a huge fan yeah. absolutely huge fan and well i mean Quite frankly, I don't think there's one scene where she's not good. Even when she's just standing mm -hmm. there, um, you know, listening to, uh, you know, the, the the big honcho there, you know, her look of dread, because you just saw a very strong scene with with her and Grant, you know, at the Smirsh training and things like that. And she's, she's pretty badass. She mm -hmm. jumps out of the helicopter. You know, the guy goes to hold her arm to help her like an old lady. And she goes, you know, get that off of me. I do love I mean, that. She's strong. And I mm. love all those subtle moments. But then, yeah, the Tatiana part is so great. And I mm. love even back in the 60s, how they, you know, they didn't overtly say, you know, lesbianism, but mm. they, they kind of gave, you know, kind of that nod saying, like, you can see some proclivities here, you know, this is somebody that is any port in a storm, you know, <laughs> she may like men, she may like women, it's all good there, you know, she doesn't care. But the threat the mm. scariness and she is small and you could see her, you know, she's demure, quite frankly, mm. but you know, they put these Coke bottle glasses on her and make her look just batshit crazy. So you're like, at any moment she could go berserk. And that's why I have to tell you at the end, when she comes in as a maid and you see her in the background and you're like, Whoa, is that, and it, she starts kicking, you get nervous because she's going mm. after a six foot three, you know, bond spy. Yeah. But you still feel like at any moment this this woman could take him down. Yeah, and in in theory it shouldn't work. Like you know, the climax of the film is Bond pinning a lady against a wall with a chair while she's sort of like freaking out. Like that shouldn't be exciting. And to its credit, I think it actually is, and and it works for a Tatiana moment. I'm sure we're going to get to talking about her soon. But the fact that the crux of the thing is who's she going to shoot? She's going to shoot her old boss. I think it it works from from that perspective as well. But absolutely no complaints about, um, you know, Rosa Klebb is one of the iconic villains of the series as well. Like she's very highly regarded. She was a character in 007 Legends. So you could play as Rosa Klebb on multiplayer. Was she really? If you too. Yeah. <laughs> did she have a Lost boot, Legend. like a, a poison knife? You know, I don't think she did, you know. Uh, no, that's a shame as well, actually, because they could have, because Oddjob has his hat. I think it would have been quite yeah. cool if she'd have, uh, yeah, that's had so the shoe. Funny. Yeah. Well, you you brought her up. So mm. um, let's talk about Tatiana. Um, I thought, you know, Daniela was, first of all, gorgeous and stunning. I mean, that's never mm. a question. Interesting, we get back to Hitchcock. Hitchcock was always obsessed. There's even a movie about it with blonde women, you know, loved blonde women. And here you have another blonde woman, but, you know, her eyes, um, she has, I think Tatiana has like Disney eyes. Yeah. Those overdrawn, gigantic eyes. She talks about her mouth being too big, but her eyes are gigantic, very <laughs> expressive, can show fear and love. You know, is it my favorite Bond girl, um, acting wise, mm. um, you know, connecting as, as a femme fatale? I would say no. And this is mm. kind of where I may have a little bit of smudge against oh, the film okay. where, you know, I... I didn't understand the whole thing at the end where she's like, am I going to shoot Bond? Am I going to shoot Cleb? Am I going to shoot mm. Bond? Because, I mean, she's telling Bond on the train and I kind of believed it. I love you. I love you. I love you. But James, I love you. Which to me just didn't ring true. You, you've mm. known this guy. You know, I know we had something similar in Spectre, but I just, I don't know what it was. I'm just not buying it. 
She's sitting at the, the, the dinner table. She's kind of falling asleep. So she's there, but she's not there. So to me, I, I would give her like um, a B, B minus as far as a Bond girl is concerned. Wow. Okay. Outside of like the physicality of her. I thought this was going to be my ace in the hole, you know. I thought we were going to be uh, quite opposed on this and then I was going oh. to... Uh, it sounds like we're actually quite... Yeah, on, on the really? same page, which is, yeah, because my, like, I, I mean, I, I, I think physically she looks stunning, obviously. Um, and I think acting wise, she does what, you know, she does fairly well with the material that she's given. I, for my, um, my big critique of the character, I guess, is that there is so much more that you can do. And I think Fleming does it more in the book as well with the whole idea of, cause she's like, in, in a way, she's the most interesting character in the thing because she's recruited you know, on behalf of this organization to kind of betray Mother Russia and to sort of get one over on Bond. She has to pretend to fall in love with him as part of her mission. So she has to kind of do what she says. And that's a great setup for some conflict. Like, you know, to see her potentially falling in love with him really instead of acting. And I don't feel like we ever get much of a sense of like, it, it, I, I certainly don't know of any point in the film where you see her turn and it becomes uh, until the very end moment where she chooses to shoot Cleb instead of Bond. But even then, uh, I don't think, I think that that moment is quite satisfying. I don't think that the build up to it makes it as satisfying as it could be because there is so much potential here for some kind of great relationship drama. She's conflicted, like, you know, is it Mother Russia? Is it Spectre? Is it Bond? Who is she going to go with? And they don't really do all that much with it. And like you say, when she's saying on the train, when he hits her and then she's saying, I love you, I love you. I'm like, this doesn't ring like she means it to me. This rings like she's acting. So I, I don't know at what point she changes over. Maybe it's on the boat at the end. Like that. That's why I asked about those scenes earlier on, because I'm like, is it in these scenes that we're supposed to see a change in her? And she's like, oh no, actually, I think I'm staying with this guy now. He's the, you know, the one I, I should be with. So I, I, I do feel like that's really botched. And it's a shame because I think it could be so fantastic. Yeah. And I've got to look, I, you know, unless I say that this was made by the angels, there's always going to be issues with every film, even the best mm. ones. And I think this could be problematic because I do like the scenes that she's in, even the one where you just talked about it on the train where Bond kind of mm. roughs her around. I, I know that's been dinged by some people of like, oh my God, he's just roughing her around. What's, you know, here's the hero of the story. And he's like, you know, slapping. This guy's a spy and assassin and he's on a job. Mm. And, you know, I hate to be like this, but this woman could be an expendable plaything to him. Mm. He, he's got to do this, you know, it's death for breakfast. So mm. I don't mind that, but I don't think she's very great in there. And then the Rosa Klebb Tatiana, I think that's probably her best part because mm. she is kind of looking wistfully like, you know, I did have a lover and you see her kind of like, kind of just trail off and everybody knows that feeling. And then she even looks at the picture and says, you know, oh, if he was kind and good to me. Mm. And I almost feel like they should have fleshed that out later. There should have been a moment where Bond did something or connected with her and she kind of looked at him like in a different way, mm. but you don't get that. So I don't understand this evolution that she had of like, that's it, screw mother Russia, mm. I'm all for James Bond. And there's a hint of that in like when, after, you know, uh, after he hits her, when they go to dinner with Grant uh, on the train, she's clearly, you know, a bit more reserved and she's not as smiley and, and happy as she was previously. And that obviously makes a lot of sense for the character. But uh, again, the focus isn't on that. And I think that that could have been really interesting in like a, in like a Bond Anya in The Spy Who Loved Me kind of a, a yeah. way. But there are definitely moments in that film where you see like, ah, okay, they've kind of switched over now and Anya isn't just on the job now. She is kind of falling for this yeah. guy. And I miss that in here. Um, I'm actually curious to know if anyone in the comments can uh, let us know if there is such a moment in there that we're supposed to understand yeah. as a sort of coming or around. even some of the people I, I know that we've got a lot of um female fans that are really mm. focusing on these films are they sensing anything that mm. they'd be like well here's that subtle moment that you guys would never see because you're oblivious i don't know um yeah. it'd be interesting to see in the comments all mm. right here we go softening again okay <laughs> not cold um the the culture the locations the travelogue part of this what did you think uh ooh. I, yeah, um, I think it... <laughs> Are you going to say something negative? 
Um, I, I'm, I'm wondering how to phrase this because while I do think that the uh, story kind of slows down a bit once we get to the gypsy camp and all that, I absolutely love the Istanbul setting and the locations that they go to. Like I'm lucky enough to have been to Istanbul many years ago now. It was like eight years ago when I was there, which was crazy. But visiting the the reservoir, the systems that they go to with all the things, um, the Hagia Sophia that they go to, um, the big mosque um it's a stunning stunning place in real life and i think the film has a really good sense of place and really captures i think it's quite distracting when you have the crowds of people who are quite clearly assembled on the you know the street opposite to watch the filming um but i, I mean i can't fault that i it, it's distracting for me later on when they they're quite clearly up in scotland <laughs> when they're filming the helicopter chase and it's like where are they supposed to even be now this is like such a, a different location from where they were previously um but i love that what do you think about it i mean i just think it was amazing <laughs> i mean i feel like and again hitchcock's very good at this too um mm. where you just get that sudden sense that you are traveling with them you're escaping mm. Um, you have been on this journey with the hero, and I felt like that in this film. And Istanbul, you know, showing all the different, like the underground, you know, kind of, you know, Venice type thing. And, yeah. um, but all the buildings and the boats. And I just, I had this wonderful sense, like the culture was sweeping over me. I mm. can imagine in the 60s, even more so. But today, I'll tell you why I felt it more, and maybe in general with Bond films. We've been in lockdown in a pandemic, so we haven't been able to travel. And when you're denied travel, whether because you didn't travel that much in the 60s or you can't travel now because of a virus, you tend to crave it. And mm. so I'm looking at these things and really this time, I just felt like the wonderment of it, you know, the visuals of it, the, the mysteriousness. And we, you and I have talked about this, you know, the, um, the Orient, you know, Asia, uh, mm. Istanbul, the Middle East, they all have this kind of strange, wonderful mystery and intrigue to it. You know, Philadelphia, not so much. Uh, <laughs> Istanbul, yes. Yeah. So I, I just think they did an amazing job. And even culturally talking about the type of coffee you know, very mm. sweet, very thick, the tea, the, the, the type of smoking that they do, you know, starting to get into that whole Bond lifestyle aspect. I think this was Bond's lifestyle meeting this, like he has the mm. Turkish cigarettes, which is very Fleming-ish. And I think they combine that so well in this film. I was going to ask you about the Bond lifestyle thing, because that is kind of my revelation in a lot of ways. On the backs of these discussions that we have, I'm seeing things in the films that I didn't before. And this film like screamed to me, like the lifestyle side of it. And, and I think it works really well. And I think that's another thing that Terence Young brought again from a character perspective. He, you know, from what I've heard in interviews and stuff, he was the one with these kinds of eye for details and like what the characters would be smoking, what they're drinking and all that kind of stuff. He's a very well-traveled man himself. Um, so yeah, how does it rate for you in in that sense? Very high. Yeah. Very, very high. I would say, and I don't know if you noticed those lists that everybody's been doing, um, the, the oh, top yeah. five bonds. Yeah. And this movie was in my top five. And one of yeah. them, one of the reasons is the lifestyle aspect. And it, I, I noticed this for the first time in Dr. No and then From Russia With Love, back-to-back -back movies, we get a scene where Bond is going into a hotel room um and and having a drink and, and checking for bugs and pouring vodka and and those are s those small little moments where there isn't an exploding volcano or uh, a mm. fight in outer space those little tiny moments i've always told you i love that where he, he takes off his jacket like you and i would he puts it down there he loosens his tie like those are all like me saying it's a projection thing it's behavioral science he's like me i yeah. would do that you know as opposed to you know, Superman who can fly over buildings. So I love the lifestyle. I love the suits. I love mm. the the lock and co brown and gray hats and things like that. You know how he wears it just so. Yeah. Um, I love, you know, the whole Grant thing and Grant making a mistake with the red versus the white um, because it's a, it's a lifestyle moment. I love when Tatiana comes out in the little negligee and things like that. And I just, I love all those like subtle clothing, accessory, lifestyle moments. That's why I say this film is so classy. It, mm. it has such incredible high polish. The whole thing to me <laughs> is just, yeah, I love it. I think you yeah. do too. I, well, I, 
Honestly, for watching it, like I watched it this morning for the purpose of this review, it's probably as most of I, as I've ever kind of enjoyed it. <laughs> really, it's uh, and I, uh, I hate. Like I say, like once they kind of get to the gypsy camp, that's when things start to go a little bit south for me. And I think a lot of it is my attention span or like mm. I kind of need, I don't want to use the word boring because I don't think it is boring, but I, I'm sort of leaning more towards that until they get to the train and then I, it yeah. kind of picks up energy again. Um, and, and I certainly don't want to sound a, like a philistine when I say this. Um, no, no, no. Because it, I, but it, I think that's very typical. And and by the way, I'm not even going to do an ageism thing of like, oh, well, that's you. You're in your early 30s. I'm in my early 50s. Harumph. I think <laughs> that is kind of what you gravitate to. I mean, you love those whimsical, fant fantasi fantastical. That's a new word. <laughs> um, <laughs> moments where I, I tend to like the kind of spy intrigue exposition, like, Look at Quantum of Solace. Right. Yeah. You have a lot of fun, and I, I tend to gravitate <laughs> to that. So um, I, I want to do something different that we've never done in these debates. I want to try this out. Oh, God. OK. It could be a total failed experiment. <laughs> um, so we're going, to, we're going to play a little bit of a game. Yes, I definitely would have some rum and coke <laughs> for this. Um, we're going to play a game. Tell me, in this movie, now that you've watched it, mm. what is your favorite scene mm. and why? What is the worst scene and why? And just by what you said, I may be able to guess, but tell me what what those are. Huh. Well, favorite scene, it's, oh, this is really tough because the train sequence is quite long. So I'm trying to think, it's definitely something in there. I I love things that set on trains. And I don't know if like Hitchcock would do it with like Lady Vanishes, North by Northwest. There is something really intriguing about this mode of transport that is quite thin and long. You can only really go one way or the other. You're trapped. You're trapped. You can't get off unless yeah. it stops. And then that, so I, I um, it's definitely that. I do love, once Red Grant gets on the thing, even before they have the dinner scene and Bond is just in the cabin with him trying to sort of figure him out. And uh, it, yeah, that's probably my favorite scene. Just that dialogue is really nice. And and I love the other stuff as well. Like the dinner scene is really nice, but yeah, that yeah. train segment. Um, in terms of worst, um, it might well be the helicopter sequence, actually. Wow. Yeah, just because it, I, I just don't know what it does. <laughs> it's like, uh, oh, I know that you're doing Hitchcock, but I don't, it, this isn't doing anything for the story. It's just action for action's sake. And don't get me wrong, like there are plenty of moments like that in Bond and a lot of it I will say that I love probably when it's action for action's sake. But in this instance, it just, and and like it, little things annoy me. Like when you see Connery kind of move out from under the rock after the helicopter's collapsed and you can see the stunt man's like there waiting for him or, or the other way around, whichever it is. And it's like, come on, can you really not have cut around this? It's so obvious that the guy's so, there. So even the execution of that scene is not your favorite obviously yeah i i guess so yeah and particularly because the north by northwest scene is so good uh it's so iconic and this is just kind of eh, it, it, it's not the same and i think helicopter sequences have been done much better in bond uh tomorrow never dies springs to instance where it kind of like tilts and the blades are chopping at bond and whaler and i think that's lovely um but uh, yeah pr probably that maybe the gypsy camp sequence um Maybe that's a close second. Okay, uh, so so here we go. Here's now that's not the game. Oh, okay. Here's here's the game. How would you make that helicopter scene better? Oh, okay. Well, I think I think it would have to link back to what we were talking about with Tanya, um, and I would need to give it some kind of purpose so that maybe she was in a direct threat and that was the scene that kind of conveyed to us the audience that she's actually coming around to bond and we see that and i think putting her in danger having him save her particularly after they've had their altercation on the train earlier on i think it would have meant something yeah. then um but as it stands it's it's just an aside because we need to have some blowing up stuff, I guess. <laughs> That's good. All right. So I'll, I'll, I'll serve up mine. And obviously okay. I'm cheating because I had plenty of time to think about this. My, <laughs> my favorite scene is very similar to yours. It comes probably oh. on the tail end of that, which is um, the conversation of once Bond basically puts uh, Tatiana to sleep and he mm. goes and speaks to Grant and Grant realizes, oh man, my cover's blown. And yeah. it's the conversation where Grant's basically holding him at gunpoint. 
yeah. and the whole attache explosion and fight. Yeah. I mean, that, that chunk of scene I could watch on a loop forever. Yeah. My, my worst, believe it or not, is the very, very last scene of the movie when they're, they're on the, the boat and he kind of holds the film up and he does oh, the snake yeah. thing. And then he goes like this and then it's just down. And I'm like, you're going to end this really great movie in kind of a goofy way. And, and the way I would make it better is either to A, end it earlier, you know, <laughs> after the Kleb shooting and stuff like that. And, you know, he gets a call from M and M says, mm. you know, Bond, are you done? Stop fooling around there. We need you. There's another case. And maybe it hints to, you know, the next Bond film or something like that. Yeah. But I just, I felt like I get it that Bond almost always ends on a boat with a woman yeah. back then. Yeah. You look at it. So it's like, oh, guys, don't forget the boat scene. But I just don't understand the whole like film thing. And where do you get it from anyway? There's a really awkward cut in there as well, where they cut out some dialogue. Um, because there's a really like, he's like yes. looking at the film and then it cuts. And I think there was a, a line in there about, um, there was supposed to be a line from Red Grant earlier on where that was the, the film of Bond and Tanya um, having sex. And I think Bond had some kind of retort to that, like, oh, he wasn't lying. It's, you know, fantastic footage or something like that. And I think for the censors, it was too much. So they cut it out. Um, but it just means that you've got this really clunky edit. And then the yeah. back projection isn't good. And then, yeah, the whole snaky thing is really strange. Um, yeah, not a big fan. <laughs> okay, so what would you give this from a one to 10, 10 being the best? What's oh, your, I... what your rating? It's so tough putting numbers on Bond films. I know you uh, hate it and that's why I do it. Because <laughs> they exist in something like so separate to like everything else for me. It's like Bond is its own thing and then just any other movie is like another thing completely. From Russia with Love, uh, I mean, I don't know if I'd go ever go below like a four or a five for a Bond film. Um, I, and I'm not putting it that low, <laughs> but it might be a... Oh, a high six, low seven. It's it's in like a, a kind 6. of six point five. Yeah, we'll we'll go with that. It's in a kind of a average entertainment okay. uh, bracket for me. What would you give it? Because I know that I'm in such a minority with this. Well, like, first of all, I'm going to email you different places uh, for the witness protection program that you can live. <laughs> I'm going to need it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I I don't even want to look. Oh God, look at that comment. <laughs> that guy didn't even finish watching this and he's already commented. That's horrible. Uh, don't do that to Calvin. Um, I would, I would give this, oh my gosh, I would give it a nine. Yeah. Like a yeah. nine, 9.5. Yeah. And by the way, I, this is really difficult for me because when I made that list, like the top five and I put Casino Royale first and, um, you know, I also have Tomorrow Never Dies in my top five. Hmm. And, you know, a lot of people were like, I thought you liked GoldenEye better. And I'm like, hold on a second. GoldenEye may be a better made film. Mm. It may be a better Bond film when you take all the parts, but I have much more fun watching Tomorrow Never Dies. So um, it's it's like that with this film. It's so well made and so well done, but mm. it, it was number five. It wasn't number two. Mm. And it certainly wasn't number one because it's not the one I'm going to be like, Ooh, that was so much fun. It's just yeah. so good. Yeah. Just to me, it's so highly regarded. Well, I think you hit the nail on the head earlier on when you talked about how kind of, and, and that was something that I appreciated actually more coming into it this time. Um, Cause in my mind, it was full of like those, like, you know, those Peter Hunt jump cuts and sped up footage and all that kind of stuff. And I, in my mind, it was a lot more choppy than what it actually is because it is a very classy film. It's very slick. It's very polished. It's, it's actually really, that there is just a, an elegance that comes off of it. And I agree with that. It's like some Bond films, are, you know, like Casino Royale, Majesty's Secret Service, films that I enjoy much more than this one, but I still put it in that same bracket of like, I, I, I don't know if like serious cinema is, you know what I mean? It's like, it's a, it's a film critic's darling. It's something quite, um, quite special. Mm -hmm. Whereas I look at something like Moonraker, which I absolutely love and adore. And I'm not going to say that that is a better constructed or better made film than From Russia With Love, but on a personal enjoyment level, which yeah. is like, that, that's the, the space where I feel like we Bond fans often are when we talk about the films. Like it, it's on a personal enjoyment basis more than oh, anything yeah. else. And uh, on, on that basis, this one's, like I say, I've never fully disliked it, but it's always ended up 
ranked quite lower for me. Um, funnily enough, I don't know if that was when I was becoming a Bond fan when I was a kid. This was the last one that I watched. And I do wonder how much of that has sort wow. of affected my opinion later on in life. I don't have much of a memory of watching. I know Moonraker came first, then Diamonds Are Forever, then Goldeneye. And then the rest are kind of murky. And then I remember seeing From Russia With Love. And this is just before Die Another Day came out. Um, so I, You I, saw A View to a Kill before From Russia With Love? I loved Roger Moore. That's true. <laughs> I borrowed all of the videotapes from a cousin. And uh, I think I must have gone through all the Roger Moore ones first. Uh, oh yeah, and then this was one of, the, uh, one of the last ones. And I do wonder how much of that was, yeah, affected my perception as all an right. adult. <laughs> well, I mean, listen, we've done this. Um, we clearly have a, a, a small gap between our affection for this film. <laughs> um, has yours improved over time? Um, slightly, yeah. Like I say, like for this, for the purpose of this discussion, rewatching it, I feel like I got a lot more out of it than I normally do. And that is on the back of partly these discussions that we have as well. I mentioned mm. it the last time as well, but these Bond lifestyle moments that I notice now, and I'm kind of like seeing things more from a character perspective than just a pure like story yeah. <laughs> perspective, story or personal enjoyment perspective. So I, I do notice more things, uh, more things like that. And I think it's a fascinating film to look at from a history perspective as well with the production and all of that kind of stuff. Um, so yeah, it, it like, it gets slightly, I, I always think of, think it's getting higher. And then I'm like, would I rather watch this or A View to a Kill though? Yeah, probably A View to a Kill still. <laughs> I just, yeah, we'll, we'll medicate you appropriately and it'll be fine. Calvin, thank you so much as usual. These aren't easy. They hurt our backs. They hurt our minds. Um, but you did good, man. I, there, there are a lot that I have to agree with you on this one. Well, likewise as well, like a lot of the positives you, you know, called out, I, I can't disagree with. There are so many positive elements to, to this film. It's, yeah. We'd still rather watch this than a lot of other things. Oh, That's yeah. the reality. Yeah, yeah. So much more. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, Calvin, so much. I can't wait for the next one. We'll have to talk about what that one's going to be. Yeah, I'm excited. <laughs> anybody's, anybody's thoughts? And this has been David Zaritsky for The Bond Experience. We'll see you all real soon. Take care. Thanks for watching this episode. If you want to be up on the latest from The Bond Experience, just click on this subscribe and subscribe to our channel. You're going to get all the latest and greatest information plus some exclusive content. And by the way, speaking of content, here's something especially for you just because we know you. Talk to you soon.